Hello, everybody. In this video lecture, we will cover transport across a cell membrane. So this is the PowerPoint that I will use. Uh, let's go ahead and begin. Cell must control the flow of material to and from the environment. Um, the cell membrane, it's not just a barrier between internal and external environment of a cell, it's a selectively permeable membrane that allow some materials to move through it and prevent others from moving in or leaving a cell. Cell membrane is selectively permeable to ions and organic molecules and controls the movement of substances in and out of cells. Um, on this picture below, you actually see very simple representation of cell membrane. It's no way it's like this. This is just shows that small molecules can pass through and the larger molecules cannot, but um, cell membrane is way more complicated. And um, we will try to understand why in this lecture. So on this diagram, you see the phospholipid um, bilayer that make the major part of a cell membrane. Um, so this uh, circular structure represent head of phospholipid and they are um, hydrophilic. And those tails inside, um, those are fatty acids and they are hydrophobic part of phospholipid. Um, and because hydrophilic facing um, water and hydrophobic uh, uh, pointing away from water, Right, that's why we are able, or your cells are able to form this uh, bilayer, double layer. So um, cell membrane is called fluid mosaic membrane. Um, this is used to describe the structure. A mosaic means it includes different components, uh, phospholipid, this yellow structure cholesterol, this blue shown uh, proteins, this blue parts and green parts, those are carbohydrates. So uh, because it's made from different components, it's a mosaic. And the fluid, uh, because those components, they are able to flow and change position while maintaining the basic integrity of the cell membrane. So these proteins, they actually um, not like stationary. They don't stay in the same position forever. They have ability to move within this membrane. Also, you can see over here inside the cell, um, those filaments are filaments of cytoskeleton, right? And some proteins are attached to this cytoskeleton, giving stability and shape to a cell. On the surface of cell membrane, we have glycoproteins and glycolipids. Together, it's called glycocalyx, and it's used uh, for recognition um, of, of the cells. Let's say your cells have this specific glycocalyx on the surface, and your immune system can recognize your cells and prevent uh, white blood cells from attacking your own cells. Plasma membrane must allow certain substances to enter and leave a cell while preventing harmful material from entering and essential material from leaving. So when material moves in and out of a cell, we call it transport. Um, there is two major types of transport. Active transport require specific energy, energy of ATP like it's shown over here, um, right? So ATP is needed to transport material into or out of a cell. And active transport will include pumps, endocytosis, and exocytosis. Passive transport does not require ATP energy. It still needs energy, but it uses kinetic energy of these um, ions or molecules. 
but passive transport doesn't require ATP. An example would be diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. So over here, we see example of passive transport. Diffusion when um, substances move through this lipid bilayer. Facilitated diffusion when um, we have a special proteins that facilitate this movement. So they help those molecules to move in and out. Um, in passive transport, we always have movement from high concentration to low concentration. We call it down the concentration gradient. In active transport, we always need a protein, right? If we're talking about pumps, endo and exocytosis, those are movement of um, stuff inside uh, vesicles. Um, and active transport requires ATP and it moves some substances from um, low concentration to high concentration. We call it against concentration gradient. So here's diffusion. Diffusion is a passive uh, transport. A single substance tends to move from an area of high concentration to the area of low concentration until the concentration is equal across the space. And this is called um, materials move down their concentration gradient. So if this plasma membrane is permeable, right? If it's not permeable, we would not have this movement. But if substances can move through, they have this tendency to move down their concentration gradient from high to low concentration until they reach equal concentration on the both sides of this membrane or equilibrium. Several factors affect the rate of diffusion. Um, how you know, steep this concentration gradient is, so extent of concentration gradient, mass of the molecule diffusing, temperature, solvent density. Right, so temperature increases, the diffusion uh, faster. Uh, larger surface area, diffusion is faster. Concentration gradient, Higher gradient increase the diffusion rate. Size of the particles, smaller particles, it's easier for them to move, to move through a membrane, so diffusion is faster. Um, when we're looking at the solvent density or diffusion medium, solid moves slowest, liquid uh, faster, and gas fastest. So those are different factors that affect the rate of diffusion. Now, facilitated diffusion is also an example of um, uh, passive transport. Substances still move down their concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration, right? From here, from bottom up, right? This is inside the cell, this is outside the cell, but they can move from inside to outside as well. Uh, no ATP is needed. The difference is those substances, they cannot directly move through phospholipid bilayer, so they need a special proteins. It can be channel protein or it can be a carrier protein. So proteins, it's like a doors, right? So if you, if you have your house, you have a door, so, you know, people can move through the door, right? So that's kind of like, well, it's, it's simple representation, it's just analogy. So material moves across the plasma membrane with the assistance of transmembrane proteins down a concentration gradient from high to low concentration without the expenditure of the cellular energy. So ATP is not used. So example would be water. Water moves through the special proteins called aquaporins Glucose can move through glucose proteins. I mean, the acid can move through the proteins as well. Now, osmosis is a special case of diffusion. And in osmosis, water moves across a cell membrane. The movement of water from higher concentration of water to a low concentration of water across PM or plasma membrane. Um, so, um, 
So we here, we just want to remind you what is solution. Solution is solute and solvent. Solute is a, well, here it says solid part of a solution. Of course, solutes can be liquid and gas as well. But just for this purpose and the purpose of, you know, this uh, lecture, uh, we can imagine that solutes are solid part of the solution and solvent is liquid part of the solution. That's not always the case. Just keep it in mind. All right. And we do need a cell membrane. Uh, so osmosis only happens if we have this selectively permeable plasma or cell membrane. Now, look, um, here we have two beakers over here. And uh, we have um, like right part, left part. Uh, yeah, well, this is right, this is left. Um, but now here we have the semi-permeable membrane. And what this membrane does, it allows only water to move through. And if we have some solutes, some particles, they cannot move through, right? So, um, so here's the blue shown water and green is a solute. Now, you see we have higher solute concentration uh, in this area and we have low solute concentration. So this solute has a tendency to move down, but it cannot because we have this memory. Now, when solute cannot move, then water will move from high concentration of water to low concentration of water, or from low concentration of solute to high concentration of solute. Right, so water always moves where solute is. Um, tonicity comparing the amount of solutes between two solutions. Uh, comparing the two solutions attraction to water. So hypertonic is very attracted to water. Like have a lots of salt, for example, right? So water will move where the salt is. Um, and in hypertonic, we have more solute than water. Hypotonic uh, has low attraction to water and composed of more water than solute. And isotonic is equal amount of water and solute. So if you look over here, uh, this example, we have a balloon and um, well, r over here, concentration of the um, solution inside balloon and outside balloon is equal. So water moves in and out, but we don't have net flow of water, right? So it's equally, equal amount moves in, moves out because water always moves. Here, we're gonna put it in a hypertonic solution. Hypertonic loves water. So water moves where solute is. So water will leave this balloon. And when water is leaving, balloon is shrinking. Now we put balloon in a hypotonic solution. Now water will move inside the balloon and balloon will expand. Now, why osmosis is important for biology and especially for human physiology or any animal physiology, right? Because think about yourself. Those are red blood cells. Your red blood cells are cells that surrounding by fluid. We call it plasma. So for red blood cells, it's very important, right, to be in isotonic solution. So water moves in and out and your red blood cells stay nice and, you know, um, can perform their functions. Now, if we have a patient, for example, that has very concentrated um, plasma, so plasma is hypertonic, hypertonic, lots, lots of solute, so then a water will leave the red blood cells and they will shrink. Now, when they're shrinking, we call it crenation. Now, if a red blood cells are inside hypotonic solution, then water will move, um, net, net movement of water will be inside a cell and cell will burst, we call it lysis. All right, so that's how it's applied to, to your physiology. It is a little bit different for plants because if you go back, animal cells, red blood cells are animal cells. Animal cells 
need to be in isotonic solution, right? Water moves in and out. Plants want to be in hypotonic solution. Plants love a lot of water around them. And um, this is because plants, they have a cell wall. Um, so they do have cell membrane. Uh, so here's a cell membrane called plasma membrane. And here's another structure as a cell wall. Um, so cell wall protects cells from shrinking or bursting. And when plant is placed in hypertonic solution, water moves out of the cell um, and uh, plasma membrane pulls away from the cell wall. Central vacuole and cytoplasm shrink, but cell shape is retained. So you can see the shape of the cell is the same, right? Because of the cell wall. But what happens when cells are in hypertonic solution, water leaves the cell, right? So water leaves the central vacuole and we have separation of plasma membrane from cell wall. And this decreases the turgor pressure. This cause turgor pressure, it um, pressure, um, outward pressure to the cell wall. Like here, you see it's nice and full. So when we have cells in hypertonic solution, or when they just uh, don't have enough water, then they wilt. So uh, when cells are in a hypotonic solution, this is a cell in hypotonic solution, then uh, central vacuole is full. Uh, we have this sugar pressure towards the cell wall and plants stay healthy. Um, so, um, if you look over here, the cell can burst, animal cell can burst in the hypotonic solution. Plant cells are perfectly fine in the hypertonic solution because of the cell wall. In hypertonic solution and even in isotonic solution, plant cells will uh, lose their um, trigger pressure and plant will look like it wilts. Okay, I think that's um, almost, oh no, we still have, okay, still have uh, many slides to cover. So what we covered so far was passive transport. Um, now active transport is moving from low to high concentration, require a carrier or helper protein and ATP. And substances are moving against a concentration gradient. So here's an example, sodium potassium pump. Um, it says in nerve and muscle cells, but that pump is found in every cell of your body. Now, what is sodium potassium pump? That's a special protein over here. You can see that's a protein uh, that um, works because of ATP. And what it does, it's kind of like pumping sodium out of a cell and potassium inside the cell. So three sodium out, three, uh, two potassium in, and ATP is used. Uh, so ATP is like a rechargeable battery. When it has charge, it's working. So this pump is working. When this phosphate group is removed, then you have ADP, and this is a battery that lost its charge. So it needs to be recharged again to become ATP and power this process, right? And we can see that we go from the uh, low concentration to high concentration. Like look, sodium, it's shown here like two maybe sodium uh, ions, and here we have a whole bunch of sodium ions, but we're still pumping stuff from low to high concentration. Um, active transport also includes vesicular transport. Um, so over here, you have a special um, carrier or helper proteins. Here we forming um, vesicles. So this is vesicular transport. Um, this particular one is endocytosis. Endocytosis means substances moves inside a cell. Three variations of endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. So phagocytosis, we call it cell eating. So it eats large particles. 
phenocytosis, water and dissolved particles move in, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Um, there is a special receptors on the surface of a cell, on the cell membrane, and the um, ions or molecules need to be attached to these receptors, and then they're taking in within the vesicle as well. So you see, it's all vesicles. It's vesicular transport, it's active transport, and because substance is moving inside a cell, it's endocytosis. So here's phagocytosis, the process by which large particles are taken in by a cell. For example, cell eating by amoeba and white blood cells. So here it shows a food vacuole, then plasma membrane extends and form um, pseudopods um, toward these extracellular particles, for example, food. Then the ends of the pseudopod fuse encircling these particles and a vesicle called the food vacuole is formed containing engulfed particle, right? So this is how cells are eating. Is it's amoeba eating its food or your white blood cells that can maybe destroy a bacteria or virus? So stuff going in, oh, microorganism, right? Stuff going in. Uh, here in the food vacuole, so then lysosome, um, special organelle inside a cell will fuse with this one, uh, secrete digestive enzyme and break down this large particle. So this is phagocytosis or cell eating. Phenocytosis, the process takes in solute that the cell needs for, uh, from the extracellular fluid. So it's cell drinking by blood cells, cells lining kidney tubules, uh, plant cells, um, so here you can see, um, this is electron um, microscope. So see this uh, vesicles are formed with a uh, fluid, interstitial fluid and some dissolved material. So uh, dimple is formed. So we don't form pseudopause, it's just a dimple forms in the plasma membrane, which um, deepens and surrounds the interstitial fluid. Uh, then um, the membrane enclo encloses this fluid forming a vesicle and whatever was outside that fluid is dissolved particles now inside a cell. So cell drinking or pinocytosis. Now receptor mediated endocytosis, the particles bind to the proteins on the plasma membrane. So those proteins are special receptors. So plasma membrane invaginates, it invaginates in, bringing the substance in the proteins into the cell. So everything goes in cell, inside a cell. Receptors and those particles. This is called coated pit. So it's um, receptor proteins for specific molecules or complexes of molecules are localized at coated pit sites. So this is, is also some different type of proteins inside, but outside of the cell membrane, special receptors. So receptors bind the molecules and the membrane dimples inward. The coated pit region of the membrane, it closes the receptor bound molecules and vesicles that called coated vesicles containing the uh, molecules and the receptors release into the cytosol. Now these receptors then can recycle, so they can move back and be incorporated into plasma membrane media. So um, that was endocytosis. Exocytosis, when vesicles containing some stuff, maybe proteins or large molecules, move towards the plasma membrane, fuse with the plasma membrane, and release their content to outside a cell. An example would be how your cells release uh, hormones, neurotransmitters, digestive enzymes. So over here on the mic electron microscope, you can see the vesicle and secreted material shown over here. So that's obviously require ATP, require energy, and this is active transport, specifically vesicular transport.
So here we have um, uh, tables that compare passive and active transport. Um, so we have direction, so diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, and uh, gated channels. Um, this is all, if, if you see we move through, oh, you better see over here, energy, it's not just any energy again, it's ATP. No, 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 then it's a passive transport. If it's required energy, it's active transport. And um, the movement is from high to low concentration for passive transport from low to high in active transport. If it's, we're talking about pumps for endoexocytosis, it's non-applicable. Uh, type of particles, for example, small non-polar for diffusion like oxygen, carbon dioxide, water moves by osmosis, facilitated diffusion, small particles, glucose, fructose, ions, and ions can use also gated channels as well, and glucose and fructose. A pumps, um, pumping ions, that's called ion pumps. And endocytosis, exocytosis, food, waste, uh, right, maybe some particles like bacteria can go in if cell wanna destroy. Okay, so I think this was our last slide. Um, reminding you that we cover transport across plasma membrane. Thank you for watching and I hope it was helpful.